Welcome to the third episode of After the Deluge. If you've enjoyed the previous two, please pass them along and rate and review them wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps new people find it, and I would appreciate it a lot. This album was released in 1974, and it's Jackson Brown's third studio album. It peaked at number 14 on the Billboard charts and was nominated for a Grammy the following year. It was ranked 375 on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. And now, as I do on each episode of this show, I'm going to read a little bit from the original Rolling Stone review that came out the year this was released. This is written by Stephen Holden. Like Brown's previous two albums, Late for the Sky contains no lyric sheet. The three or four hours required to make a full transcription will, however, be well worth the effort for anyone interested in discovering lyric genius. I can't think of another writer who merges with such natural grace and fluidity his private and public personas in a voice that is morally compelling yet non-coercive. So this is something my guest and I talk about. My guest, by the way, is Stephen Hyden, not to be confused with Stephen Holden, the writer who reviewed this in Rolling Stone in 74. Stephen refers to Jackson Brown as a diarist, and that is not something I'd thought about, but it really does ring true to me. He's sharing real things from his real life in a real way. He's doing so creatively and poetically, but he's not overly dressing them up. He's kind of coming directly at you with them, more so than on any other album. He's really opening up on this one. And I'll introduce Steven a little more in just a moment. Late for the Sky is his most mature, conceptually unified work to date. Its overriding theme, the exploration of romantic possibility in the shadow of apocalypse. No contemporary male singer-songwriter has dealt so honestly and deeply with the vulnerability of romantic idealism and the pain of adjustment from youthful narcissism to adult survival as Brown has in this album. Late for the Sky is the autobiography of his young manhood. The album's central images are those of water and sand, reality and dreams, sky and road, inextricably connected. Brown's melodic style, though limited, serves his ideas brilliantly. He generally avoids the plaintive harmonies of Southern California rock bands for a starker, more eloquent musical diction derived from Protestant hymns. Its fervor is underscored by the sparest and hardest production to be found on any Brown album yet. The title cut, Late for the Sky, explores an affair at its nadir, concluding with an image of the sky, the album's symbol for escape, salvation, and death. Stephen and I spend a ton of time on the title track in this conversation, and Stephen speaks really eloquently about it from a lot of angles, not some of the ones that might be most obvious to a lot of people who've spent a ton of time with this album, because this song specifically has kind of a important life that lives even beyond being the title track and first track on this specific album. The third track, Farther On, defines Brown's quest as a citadel in a vision of paradise. Its desolate conclusion finds Brown alone and older, with my maps and my faith in the distance moving farther on. So we get into how great the four songs on side A of this album are, but we don't really get into farther on, and it's one of my favorite songs of his, both musically and lyrically, so I just want to share a small part that I love. It's this high harmony that comes in the choruses. It's just one of my favorite musical moments in anything, by any artist on any album. So you might need headphones, but once you hear it, you'll never unhear it. For a Dancer is a meditation on death that harks back to Song for Adam. But For a Dancer is not a lament. It calls for joyful procreation to combat metaphysical terror. Brown's graceful lyric, as fine as he's ever written, finds its counterpart in the music, an ethereal tango in which David Lindley's fiddle dances against Brown's vocal. So my guest on the first episode of this podcast was a musician named William Matheny, And he called Late for the Sky sort of the full flowering of David Lindley. And I love that phrasing, and it's very true. Um, I think the reviewer does a great job of getting at the fact that this is his most cohesive album. It all feels very much cut from the same cloth. And then the other thing that binds it is David Lindley. And something about the tone of his slide guitar and his fiddle, it's all very lightly distorted in some kind of way. It just... It's David Lindley at his peak. I mean, he starts going off real hard on on running on empty in a lot of special ways, but as far as studio albums go, this is like, you're getting the best of Lindley here.
Before the Deluge, the album's summary cut evokes the spiritual malaise following Woodstock. The chorus's final statement follows a verse so imagistically potent as to suggest literal prophecy. And when the sand was gone and the time arrived, in the naked dawn only a few survived, and in an attempt to understand a thing so simple and so huge, believed that they were meant to live after the deluge. Oh damn, that's the part where we say the title of the podcast in the, uh, within the show. That review, once again, was written by Stephen Holden in Rolling Stone in 1974. A quick note that I've had a couple people reach out to me asking why we're only playing short snippets of the songs, and the reason is because we don't own them. So we're allowed to play short little snippets, um, and what we strongly recommend is you finish the podcast, get excited about the album, and go put it on. And now on to our guest, whose name is Stephen Hyden. Stephen is a culture critic for Uproxx, and he's the host of a podcast called Rivals, which looks at... Um, band and artist and musical rivalries throughout history. It's awesome. I just listened to the uh, Dixie Chicks and Toby Keith early aughts post-Iraq War episode, and it was amazing. You can follow Stephen Hyden on Twitter at Stephen underscore Hyden. That's S-T-E-V-E-N underscore Hyden. Stephen is the author of the book Your Favorite Band is Killing Me, which, similar to the podcast, explores those rivalries and Twilight of the Gods, which is a book about classic rock. And he's currently working on a book about Radiohead's groundbreaking album Kid A. So I'll be totally transparent about the fact that I was very excited to talk to Stephen. I came to love his writing through the website Grantland, which had a tragic death a few years ago. I followed him on Twitter around that time and later came across a piece he'd written about music and movies in which he talks about the song Late for the Sky in the movie Taxi Driver. He also wrote a really fun article about something he calls the five album test, and that's where we start this conversation, so enjoy. Do you mind describing in sort of the quick snapshot way what the five albums test is? And then we could talk about that in Jackson Brown in the context of that, and then get into Late for the Sky. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that was a column I wrote, um, I think it was like 2011, when I was at the AV Club. And, you know, it was it was kind of like, you know this this silly idea like it was like okay this is going to be a new way to ter- to determine like an artist's greatness you know can you f- find five consecutive albums in their catalog uh that are that you would consider to be great and the idea of the column is that there was actually like some really good people that you maybe that maybe didn't pass the test yeah. like i think i made the case that bob dylan didn't pass the test which is being in which is maybe kind of insane i don't <laughs> i don't know i mean but you know but it was like a good it was a good conversation starter and it's something that people still remember i mean i've written about it a, a couple of times and it, it's just like a fun idea uh you know way to it's like another way to kind of talk about artist discographies you know because i think that is a pretty um unique thing to be able it, it says a lot about your quality control if you can put out five great records in a row um and then as far as jackson brown goes i think because i think we're probably talking about the 70s first and foremost with with jackson brown if you're going to try to make a case for him passing that test and the album that trips it up for me is the pretender i love the first three records and i love running on empty but the pretender for me is is like the weak link and i don't think it's a bad record but um it's definitely like a, a notch below the four other ones. I mean, the thing about Jackson Brown is that I actually feel like he's had a pretty consistent career, I think, overall. Like, you know, the albums that he made after the 70s, I, I tend to like, too. And even, like, the albums that he's made, like, you know, in the middle age and into old age, you know, yeah. I've enjoyed. You know, like, the, the albums that he's put out, that album, like, Standing in the Breach, I thought was a pretty yeah. good record. I mean... I'm Alive would probably be like a top five record for me by Jackson Brown. So, you know, that you know, is in the 90s. So if you look at his contemporaries, like that Southern California, you know, singer-songwriter scene of, of the 70s, you know, like on one extreme, you have someone like Joni Mitchell, who I think everyone would agree is this like one-of-a-kind, iconoclastic, you know, genius, you know, like a definitely like a one-of-a-kind type talent. And then on the other extreme, you'd have someone, you'd, you'd have the Eagles, who are like the consummate craftsmen, you know, like the people who, like the Eagles are the band that go in the studio 
and they like work on the same song for like 18 months and by the end of that process the song is perfect and it goes on the radio and it's played a bajillion times and then on Joni Mitchell is the one who's like you know coming up with these like brilliant songs and she works hard on her songs too but there's something more intuitive about it it's not quite as like you know beaten to death and she has more of like I guess the thing that you would associate with like a Bob Dylan or a Neil Young, you know, like that kind of genius type thing. My point was that I feel like Jackson Brown's somewhere in the middle. He's a very, you know, he's his own man. He has a very strong character to his music. It's very personal, obviously. Uh, but he's also a tunesmith. You know, he's really good at writing catchy songs. And he does have those songs that are on the radio still that kind of keep his name out there. So I don't know. It's like he's kind of in this no man's land where he's not just like a pure hit maker, but he's also not quite on that level of like the other sort of genius bard. Uh, So yeah, it's it's really, so he's really interesting in that regard to me. I kind of love that like his five album thing is squarely in the seventies. It's like from 72 to 79. And so this is like an album coming out right in the middle of the seventies with these other albums. Right. Is there a, favorite moment or song on this album for you well i mean i think if you talk about this record i mean it really begins and ends with i think with the title track you know it's hard i mean i think the whole album is really strong i think there's a lot of great songs on it but like the the first song i think towers over the rest of the record Are the words had all been spoken And somehow the feeling still wasn't right And still we continued on through the night You know, he's he's one of those people that is basically like a diarist. You know, like he is describing whatever is on his mind at a particular moment in time. And, you know, you listen to Late for for the Sky, and it's clearly this song. He's, He's describing... The moment when that I, I think everyone has been in at some point where you're in a relationship and you realize that the relationship is over and you haven't broken up yet, but you know that you are on the road to breaking up and you're in bed with this person that you thought was your soulmate and they're not your and, and you and you know that they're not. You look at them and you're like, wow, this person I thought I knew they don't I, I don't know them and they don't know me. And and just the loneliness of, yeah. of that feeling. You haven't you haven't broken up with each other yet, but really you sort of broke up long ago. Right, exactly. And he describes that in a very sort of plain spoken way, a very powerful way. But to me, it's like the way that he sings it. And I don't think Jackson Brown is necessarily a dynamic singer, but I think he is an ex- he is an expressive singer, and and it comes across, I think, especially in that song. Um, but also, the star of that song in a way and i think of the whole record is david lindley uh his guitar his guitar playing on that record and of course david lindley has played on a bunch of jackson brown records but for me late for the sky is the one where he's bringing the most to the table about Jackson Brown's vocals playing off David Lindley's guitar. Like David Lindley's guitar is very prominent, and especially on Late for the Sky, his guitar is just sort of shadowing the vocal. Yeah, he has his entire song. He has his big moment solo type stuff, but he sort of just f- set loose to noodle around like right. throughout, right? It's very yeah, and it's very expressive. Um, and the, you know, I was listening to it today. It was, and I never, I never had this thought before. But it was almost reminding me of like, almost like if like the the Almond Brothers wrote, like played like a really slow song or something. That you know, there's something almost like Dwayne Almanish about his guitar playing um, on that song. Uh, you know, it was evoking that a little bit for me uh, when I was listening to it again today. I feel that. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it's so beautiful. So yeah, I mean. To get back to your original question, I mean, I think the title song is unquestionably like the <laughs> it is the star of the show, and yeah. and that song creates a mood that 
continues throughout the entire record. I mean, I think for the most part, I mean, I, I would consider Late for the Sky to be a mood record. Because uh, again, it's not, yeah. it's not musically dynamic. There's not a whole lot of variety, and when there, but when there is, like uh, uh, that song, like the road in the sky, kind of like a rocking song, and it's like that's usually the song I skip because it's like I don't really need a rocking song on this album. I kind of want to stay in the same groove, you know, because it's like that song, that title track puts you in this sort of melancholy frame of mind. And it's like, okay, I'm just going to be in this frame of mind for the next 40 minutes. I fully thought that too and wondered, like, do I do I appreciate this sort of, like, pickup moment? Or it does it feel like a departure from the journey we're going on together? Same thing with Road in the Sky and then the one that comes walking slow that comes two tracks later with, like, the didgeridoo yeah. and stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm good. I've, I've, I'm actually better with it now than I was 10 years ago, but I have always like thought oh, this can just be a thing that I'm just like sad to this can just be a collection of sad songs for me and I'd be fine with that yeah I mean I don't feel like Jackson Brown wrote like a really great like rock song until running on empty I thought like I think that's his first kind of great like rock and roll song I think before that his best songs tend to be either mid-tempo introspective songs or just like straight up ballads and then in the 80s, actually, I feel like when he was getting more, in, when he was in more of like sort of like a new wave uh, frame of mind, you know, the like his more rocking songs I actually really started to enjoy more. Like in you know, like the Lawyers in Love era, and of course, you know, Somebody's Baby being, you know, from the Fast Times soundtrack. I think Somebody's Baby is like genius pop music, but right. I... I like I am not on I am not on the level of like absolutely loving lawyers in love but I I love that you are. Yeah, I mean, I have an affection for that sort of pop rock thing that he that he embraced in the 80s, you know, that sort of new wavy sound and then like when he got to like Lives in the Balance, putting his spin on that sort of like synthy heartland rock sound from like Born in the USA. Like that I feel like that was definitely you know something that he was playing with on that record and i thought it suited him pretty well because again like for me jackson brown i think of him as a as like a as a tunesmith first yeah i i just think he writes good tunes usually i came to him i absolutely love his lyrics probably more than any other musician but also like uh, they're part of the larger like sort of thing he's making which is like he is a tunesmith and he is a Lyrics need to resonate with who they resonate with, you know? That's just, that's sort of the ultimate thing you either, you connect with how you want to connect with it. There's no right or wrong to that. Yeah, and I think like in uh, uh, on this record, on, on Late for the Sky, you know, it's definitely, you know, this is definitely like a young man coming to grips with adulthood record. Like I think he was probably like 25 or so when this record yeah. came out. Um, and you can tell when you hear the songs that, you know, like in Late for the Sky, that seems very much written from the perspective of someone who has like not gone through a breakup before or like that was his first yeah. breakup and it's like really knocked him on his ass. Or there's songs like, actually I was thinking about The Late Show, which I think is the song where he talks about how, you know, people ask you how you're doing because it shows how much they don't really care. I love that lyric. You know, see, and it's a good line, but like, you know, there's a part of me, and again, I love that song, but there's a there, there's a part of me that kind of rolls my eyes a little bit at that because it's like, <laughs> yeah, who? Why should people care about your feelings? You know, like <laughs> they have their own lives. Like you know, you don't need to like tell everyone how you feel. You know, but that is something I think that when you're 25 is very profound. Every when I've ever known has wished me well. Anyway, that's how it seems, it's hard to tell Maybe people only ask you how you're doing Cause that's easier than letting on how little they could care What's funny as you say that it's like a, a, a young person growing up is as I've done a few of these interviews, he kind of basically spends three albums growing up like this. I've come to realize like he's doing a lot of sort of contemplating, like navigating growing up writing these days and recording with Nico when he's like 16 and a half or something like 
I, so I guess that's something that comes with being an introspective, thoughtful person that starts making music at a young age. But yeah, uh, and I think, right. and I think that's again like his style of of songwriting. Again, I, I think he is a diarist. You know, he's someone who is like writing about his feelings in the moment and like what is going on in his life right now yeah and he's not really putting a spin on it you know he's not plugging it into a story i think there's a power to that but it also you know like like when bob dylan was 21 and he was just a different type of person but like he like on his first record most of his songs are about death you know and he was he was a guy that like wanted to be older he would uh sort of aspire to that in his songs like he's going to write a song like masters of war about like yeah the, the the you know the war industrial complex and it's like well what do you know about that you're 21 years old you know but he <laughs> did write this profound song about it um so in a way that maybe masks some of the typical things that you go through at that age you know be, because in a way at least like on his early records he was really kind of trying to write about big topics um whereas Jackson Brown didn't really do that until, you know, he was in his 30s or, you know, approaching yeah, he, 40. He, he basically makes a decade of music before it's like doing a sort of full on announced pivot toward talking about that. And yeah. There's like little there's little nods to uh, sort of climate stuff that sometimes I wonder if I'm interpreting it that way because I know he's an environmentalist, but it. It, nothing it gets very explicit in the 80s but it's really not there well you know i mean late for the sky does end with before the deluge which you know seems you know is this apocalyptic song and you can that song i guess you, you could look at it at the time you know in the 70s there was a lot of fear about you know like nuclear pro- proliferation and obviously jackson brown ended up being involved in the no nukes concert later in the 70s uh so that may have already been on his mind in in you know the early to mid seventies when he was making this record, um, but you could listen to that too, and you could also, if you want to listen, if you want to kind of look at it through a more sort of contemporary perspective, you could listen to a song like that and feel like oh he's talking about environmental disaster. Exactly, like I just you basically know. assumed that's what it was, and then I listened to it in the last couple of days, and he he's not he never directly is saying that. You can very easily connect those dots, but it's... And he could have just been talking about, you know, he could have just been feeling that way because he was a self-pitying young man and he had his heart broken and he feels like the world is ending because, you know, when you when you have yeah. your first breakup, when you know, when you have your first breakup like in your 20s, I know this is how I felt, like you feel like the world is over, you know? So maybe it's like, oh, well, my life is over. The world is over, so you know I'm, I'm writing this song from 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 that perspective. So I mean, you could so you can interpret it that way too. And when the sand was gone and the time arrived, in the naked dawn only a few survived, and in attempt to understand the thing so simple and so huge, believe that they were meant to. After the deluge. When I when I call it a young man's record, it, that's not a criticism necessarily. I think it's like it's just something that I think I heard this album for the first time when I was in my twenties, and I think I heard it differently then than I do now. And it's interesting because I often think about how the song was used in Taxi Driver when I hear yeah. the record because that's the first time I ever heard "Late for the Sky," and I don't think I oh see that's. I don't think I knew. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I don't think I knew um, that it was Jackson Brown uh, the first time I I heard it. I didn't know it was Late for the Sky. I just thought I just knew it was this song because, uh, like, for people that haven't seen the movie, there's a scene where Chab Spickle is alone in his apartment and he's holding a very large gun and he's watching American Bandstand and there's all these teenagers dancing and Late for the Sky is playing on the soundtrack. I remember the first. You know, several times. I, I've Taxi Driver is my favorite movie, so I've seen that many times. I, cool. uh, but, but I know, like the first several times I watched it, I think I thought that the kids on American Bandstand were dancing too late for the sky. But I think I figured out that it, they're not. That that's a song that is on the soundtrack. That it's I forget the name. There's a term for this for for a song that is in the scene and then a song that's not it's out of the same it's like intrinsic sound or something like gosh that. i never thought of at that. any rate 
But at any rate, I don't because I always thought like, man, it'd be weird for them to be dancing to this song because it wasn't a hit. It wasn't a pop hit. You know, why would this be on American Bandstand? Yeah, so that so like the meta part, like the music critic in me was always like, why? What, this doesn't make any sense. But I, I'm pretty sure that they're not. I, I, I'm pretty sure that it was laid over by Martin Scorsese uh, yeah. on the soundtrack. But um, it's interesting how that movie changes the meaning of the song because the song on its own, I think, is written from the perspective of someone again who is in a relationship and is feeling alone in his relationship because he knows it's over so it's that feeling of feeling lonely even with when you're with another person which is like kind of the worst kind of loneliness but when you watch taxi driver you know that movie recontextualizes that song where um it's about someone who has never been in a relationship you know who hasn't even had the pain of breaking up with someone because he's never even had the chance to to be in love which is even more tragic you know it's even sadder yep. and you know and there's that line where he's talking about you know how long have i been sleeping how long have i been drifting through the night how long have i been sleeping Obviously, something that you can apply to Travis Bickle, who's like driving around at night all the time, and he's sort of in this car, always surrounded yeah. by people, but he's alone. And um, so, in a way, I feel like that movie it 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 deepened the song for me because it it turned it from not just a song about breaking up; it's a song just about loneliness in general, and and how you know maybe you're with someone. Uh, who you don't love anymore and that makes you feel lonely or maybe you just feel lonely because you hear this song that, that's a breakup song and you wish that you could be that guy in the song that you wish you even had that you know yeah. and like and the melancholy of that um, so so it's so cool to me to hear that the way you came to that was you love Taxi Driver watched Taxi Driver and heard that song for the first time because I as a person who like had Jackson Brown playing in my house when I was 14 years old and then sort of like heard it in ways and then discovered it on my own in my sort of like uh brooding 20s like came like in my late 20s and decided like oh I'm gonna watch Taxi Driver like I'm in this period of my life where I'm watching older movies that I hear are important and good and so I wa I start watching Taxi Driver with no idea that scene's coming but I already have a I already have a connection to that song like I think that song's amazing and when that moment comes up in that movie and I know that song but didn't know I was about to get that song I like can't even describe the way it landed on me like I I just was like totally like knocked out by it it's it's so it's such a good use of music in a movie yeah I I love it it's one of my favorite uh uses of music in, in, a, in a movie for sure I was gonna say one, another thing I think about when I hear Late for the Sky is I read this interview once with uh with Jay Bennett uh the late great musician who used to be in Wilco and uh he was talking about lyrics and how ultimately it doesn't matter if lyrics have a linear meaning because it's it's more about what they evoke in the listener and he talked about late for the sky and he was saying like i've listened to late for late for the sky you know hundreds of times and i still don't know what it means but i do know <laughs> that it's like one of the greatest songs ever written you know, and I remember I read that interview a long time ago, probably like twenty years ago, and I, that's always just stuck in my head. That was always, that was like a really kind of like, oh yeah, like it, I don't know, it just kind of blew me away. And so I think about Jay Bennett now when I hear that song too, and Jay Bennett being another sort of you know lonely person who died before his time. You know, that kind of that's an, I don't know, it's just like another kind of tragic wrinkle in that song for me. So yeah, I, I think about yeah. Travis Bickle and Jay Bennett, I feel like when I listen to Late for the Sky and, and sometimes thinking of those things make you know, chokes me up. 
when I play that song. It's funny you talk about like the road in the sky as being like the song that kind of feels like, all right, you've this vibe is set, you're sort of on this path, and it kind of like takes a turn that you don't necessarily need. I always felt that about walking slow and this like, like, uh, this just feels like this like shoehorning in of a something that needs to feel good in a thing that is otherwise not feeling that way. And I don't know if it's just because I've like in the middle of my thirties and everything, but I don't necessarily feel that way anymore. It feels I could I would ditch the I, if I were to remaster this album, I would pull the didgeridoo the <laughs> sound out of it and uh, let the song ride and feel pretty good about it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like like side one of "Late for the Sky" is like is is, is perfect. And you know, if I don't. Like I said before, sometimes I put this album on, on and I hear Late for the Sky, the title track, and I'm like, okay, I'm already emotionally exhausted. I can't listen to more of this album. Um, the thing about this record, though, is that, you know, I mean, Jackson Brown had hits already at this point. I mean, he had, you know, Doctor My Eyes on the first record. Um, I mean, I feel like this record was a a pretty brave album to make because there's not a whole lot of, like, potential singles on this record you know maybe there was no. a feeling that i need to have a couple upbeat rockers here that they could play on the radio you know because you know the songs like th- like those first four songs not only are they all sort of mid-tempo downbeat numbers they're also really long i mean they're all like over five minutes long fountain of sorrow is almost seven minutes long um and fountain of sorrow has like a lot of words in it too um, yeah. And like, even the choruses are like different, like every time. There's this loneliness springing up from your life, like a fountain from a pool. Fountain of sorrow, fountain of life. In terms of like the pop market, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to grab onto. And, you know, I don't know a ton of Jackson Brown history, but my instinct is that he probably pivoted to the to the pretender and working with John Landau because there was probably a feeling like we have to get this guy back to making hits or like more sort of like radio friendly records because you know John Landau of course you know, worked with Springsteen on on Born to Run you know which was a huge record and it seemed like the pretender was him starting to move toward being more of like a rock star type performer and less of a singer songwriter like those first three records are such singer songwriter records and then the next three you know you've got the pretender um running on empty and then hold out you know which hold out is like pretty much just a straight up rock record almost like a, an, an arena rock record i, I like that record I, I think that if running on empty is not made in the way that it's made it sort of takes what they did on pretender and probably goes you probably jump up to like the production rock arena value of of holdout basically the only reason it's not entirely that is because of it's has all this sort of like recorded in hotel rooms and buses kind of feel to it and i mean moving in that direction like made him a star although i do think it sacrificed some of the sort of like personal aspects of of his songwriting you know some of the emotional impact like boulevard i think is like a really great radio song but like you know that song's not really about anything, you know. It's a, that it's not really about Jackson Brown. It's like you know, you know, being on the streets. I guess that song, you know, or whatever. It's just like it's like a it's yeah. like it's like a rock and roll jam that you hear on the radio. It's like a good song. Whereas, like, I mean, I think a song like "Running on Empty" is like a personal song, and you know, I think I yeah. think that does that is sort of like, in a way, that's sort of like his his "Tangled Up in Blue." You know, like like "Tangled Up in Blue" being like a song where Bob Dylan is taking stock of his life at that moment uh, in his career. You know, like that's what Running on Empty is for Jackson Brown. You know, he's sort of, he's like looking back on like the last, you know, 12, 13 years of his life and, um, you know, trying to figure out like how he got to that point. But again, like I say, like I, with, with Jackson Brown, uh, I'm not looking necessarily for rock jams from him. I'm looking for something a little more like, yeah. like more country rock than Joni Mitchell but like not as like jockish as the eagles 
the comparison I put in my head as a kid who grew up in the 90s, and this could just very much be me, but um, the sort of best comparison of my childhood that I could say sort of played the Jackson Brown role was the Counting Crows. Like it was, these right. are catchy pop songs, but these are thoughtful songs. These are sad songs. They're it's kind of this middle line that, at its high at its height, is like the best. But you're not thinking of him as the best songwriter ever. But he's an amazing songwriter. Adam Duritz is, and I right. I don't know. It's it's kind of like that's how I've sort of just something I've slotted in in my head. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair comparison. I think you know, like in the '90s, Cunning Crows were a band that were like. I think Duritz was like a better songwriter and more thoughtful than like the guy in Blues Traveler. But like he wasn't an indie rock guy like, you know, like a Stephen Malkmus or a David Berman or something. You know, like 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 he he would never have that kind of credibility because Counting Crows sold so many records. So it's sort of this like weird no man's land, like where you're not really cool to anybody, you know. <laughs> like if you're yeah. in that zone. Like in in terms of like mainstream rock you might be popular, but people are going to look at you as sort of like a whiny, you know, sad sack type band. And then in the indie rock world, you're like, well, you're you're super popular and, and slick and, you know, you're way too populous for us to care about. And I think Jackson Brown d- does have that same sort of, I think he's in a similar lane in the 70s, like where, you know, he also wasn't going to make songs like the Eagles, which, you know, the Eagles could write party songs you know the kind of songs that like you know you get drunk to and like go to football games you know blasting in the parking lot or something and jackson brown didn't really make those kind of records either you know he was in the middle like where it's like yeah he's he's really good at writing songs um he's really smart guy but he's also never going to be the outsider so uh in a man in a way he's like a man without a country you know, in the seventies, I agree. Yet, uh, although he was at the same time, and he was part of that asylum family, and and a lot of yeah. people were on his records, so I don't think he was like. And Geffen Geffen basically builds his whole thing off uh, sort of Jackson Brown as the foothold. So like, yeah. The other thing about Jackson Brown is that he's like such a good looking guy that it yeah. almost like I think that plays against him in a way because he can write these really sad songs but you just look at him and you're like well okay yeah you're sad and late for this guy but you can just go to the roxy you know on the sunset strip and pick up like any woman you want after this so like (laughs) you know whereas you listen to like warren zevon and you're like well look at this guy i mean he, he he does he looks like a he looks like he's been you know dragged on you know three miles of bad road and you, you can buy into what's in his songs a little bit easier just because of his persona. Um, so I don't know. I feel like that maybe played against Jackson Brown sometimes that he was such a, you know, he's like a great looking guy. I remember like when he was inducted in the rock and roll hall of fame by Bruce Springsteen, Springsteen made a comment about how good looking Jackson Brown was and like how many, and how there were always great looking women at his shows. <laughs> and like, <laughs> like that's Bruce Springsteen saying that and Bruce Springsteen was like jealous of Jackson Brown about, all these women that he was able to pull he's, but he's like laid back california personified basically and yeah and you're like oh he's fine he'll always be fine you don't need to worry about this guy but you know there's also like a lot of turmoil in his songs and he and he went through some terrible things in his life The other thing we have to say too about Leaf for the Sky is that it has one of the all-time great album covers. Um, it's an excellent album cover, and uh, it's it, it's one of those covers that uh, it makes you want to move to Los Angeles. Like yeah. it just, like, I just just look, you know, looking at that apartment building, you just like, that bungalow, whatever it is. You're like, oh man, that I, looks, it's the, the sky looks amazing. And you're like, wow. I have this story about that album cover. Like, so I, I studied in Spain when I was like 21 years old. And I took a trip to Italy to visit a friend who was living there. And so, like, I wander around. I'm wandering around Venice, Italy by myself. And I just hop in and go check out this 
the, like the it was called the Peggy Guggenheim collection I remember and it was this art museum and I walk into this room and it's nothing but a room full of paintings of like sort of dark shadowed homes and buildings and 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 scenes with the sky painted bright blue and with white clouds on it and I was like wait a second like what is this like what the fuck am I seeing this is clearly like there's no way that late for the skies album cover in, exists independent of this. And then I looked it up later and it's, he, he designed that cover. It's like a two photos spliced together, but basically it's this artist named Rene Marguerite had a series called empire of light. And his, he made that cover based on this lady's collection of art. She made and just was cool to like cat stumble into that naturally. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. It's where it's worth it. It's, it's worth checking out those paintings and like he and he's got like the Chevrolet car in the driveway and stuff which you hear on the album and it's reference and all that it just feels very it kind of in keeping with the way I think this is the most cohesive of his albums whether or not it's the best like that extends all the way to that cover and everything it's just so cool. it's it's two photos spliced together it's sort of like yeah the reason it's so striking is that it's a, a sky during daylight and a building with its light on at night like it you don't register that right away when you see it but that's why that's okay it's it's super cool yeah it's great i mean i i remember like on the almost famous uh dvd there's like a uh one of the bonus things is about like cameron crow's favorite albums of 1973 and he mentions late for the sky even though it came out the following year but he talks a lot about the album cover there I remember him saying, just talking about how evocative um, that album cover is. And uh, yeah, I mean, and it just ties the package together because you're like, oh yeah, that cover fits the record because you feel like this is an album that you're going to play, you know, when you're like the guy in the title track, when you're, you're having this epiphany in the middle of the night that your life is about to change and uh you're scared and you're feeling sad about it and you're just going to kind of ruminate on it for a while you know that's the vibe of this record i feel like you know and uh the cover perfectly evokes that that feeling so you know when you want to be in that frame of mind you know because Sometimes it's pleasurable to be in that frame of mind if you're not actually going through a trauma in your life. You know, it's sometimes it's kind of nice to feel that melancholy. You put this record on and you can feel that melancholy by proxy. So, you know, that's what Jackson Brown's doing for you. Uh, that's the reason I love Jackson yeah. Brown, honestly. I have a, I've said this in other interviews during this, but it, I have a healthy appetite for that. And I don't know why. I think it's, uh, I don't know. And, and he's a good uh, well to go to, especially on this album. Feels especially somber. Is Late for the Sky Jackson Brown's best album? Um, it's interesting. I mean, I was thinking about this question. And I figured this would come up uh, in the conversation. It it's not my favorite of his albums. I think my favorite album is uh, Running on Empty, just because conceptually, I I, I love the idea of making a album about life on the road and making it on the road you know like recording you know conventional live concert performances and and recording in hotel rooms and on the tour bus and all that um yeah you can i I think hear the gears shifting and stuff yeah it's such a clever idea and i wish more people would would rip it off you know i the only band that I, that I can think of that made a record kind of like that after Jackson Brown was um, R.E.M., uh, New Adventures in Hi-Fi. Uh, you know, they did something similar, like where they recorded, you know, they, it was all original songs, but they were recorded on the road. Just that idea of, like, making a live record also behind the scenes at the same time. You know, again, I think that's such a clever idea. Uh, so that's probably my favorite album. But, you know, Late for the Sky, I think in terms of like uh like songwriting is probably his his best record um you know because like because like running on empty obviously like he didn't write a lot of those songs a lot there's a lot of covers on that record yeah uh so so looking at it from like a writing perspective i i feel like that's probably his best collection of songs well 
it was so. really it was great talking to you i fully enjoyed this and i again totally appreciate you taking the time and yeah So that was Late for the Sky, and I want to thank Stephen Hyden for joining me. I really enjoyed that conversation. Tune in next week. We're going to do The Pretender, and I've got a fun thing planned for that one. Bye.